The first seven lectures in this uh, series have been devoted to great artists, Wang Meng, Huang Gung Wang, or artists whom I deserve more attention, Cheng Shi Fa, for instance, Xiao Mi, or perhaps groups of artists, the orthodox masters of the late Ming and early Qing, or the artists who produced the Sogen Ga kinds of paintings that mostly made up the Hiko An album. In doing this, I followed the standard practice. Those of us who write and talk about European painting usually devote most of their space to the great masters or to the modern masters at length uh, until well into the 20th century. And the same has been true of most writing and publishing about Chinese painting. And now for something completely different. That's an old Monty Python line. I was never a great fan of theirs, but some of their lines have found their way into the language, and that's one of them. If I were to assign readings for this course, uh, they would begin with my own recent book titled Pictures for Use and Pleasure, uh, since that's all about just the kind of paintings that I'll be showing and talking about in this lecture. Pictures for Use and Pleasure, vernacular painting in Haiching, China. In fact, three of the five paintings that will be the main subjects of this lecture, and will be shown at great length here, have sections or leaves reproduced from them in my book. But in these lectures, I have lots of time and lots of images, and I can show them completely, or at least more completely than I could possibly do in a book. The next images, please. Early on in my book, I reproduced these two paintings, both hand scrolls, as examples of what the book will be about, the picture at right, and at left, of what it would not be about, the hand scroll painted in 1625 by the late Ming scholar official Li Ruhua. He was one of those I talked about in the fourth lecture in this series, the one on the Orthodox masters and Xiaomi. Li Ruhua was one of those who were swept away by the new mode of landscape introduced and practiced by Dong Chi Chang and his followers as the proper way for the scholar artist to paint. His painting is all about brushwork and high-minded restraint and is nothing much as a picture, I think at least. I quote in my book the praise that is lavished on it in a recent exhibition, and I'll quote that later. The other hand scroll is one we found in the study collection of the Central Academy of Fine Arts with a false attribution to Chu Ying and uh, reproduced and exhibited for the, about just about the first time. It depicts a New Year's celebration in the courtyard of a gentry household with the elders looking on from the doorway. Next. And the children playing all kinds of games in the courtyard. I remark in writing about it that, apart from its artistic interest, it would provide a lot of visual information about New Year's celebrations and other things. But any traditional Chinese connoisseur would glance at it and roll it up quickly, saying, Su Zhou Pian, or Chiu Yang Fake. My argument in my book and in this lecture is that the so-called academic kinds of painting, if we really look at them, instead of putting them away as low class and trivial, often turn out to have a lot to offer. Next, please. Next in my book, I reproduce these two paintings and discuss them and their artists at some length. The landscape is by Wang Shermin, whom I talked about before as the oldest of the so-called Four Wangs, central figures in the Orthodox school of late Ming to early Qing landscape. The other picture, a picture of Emperor Ming Huang secretly watching his future consort Yang Guifei bathing, is in the Fuji E Yunin Khan in Kyoto. It's cataloged there as anonymous Ming, but I attribute it by style to Wang Shermin's contemporary and friend Gu Jianlong, a painter of the other kind. Wang Shermin belonged to a prominent family and had the right training to be a literatus. Gu Jianlong was a prolific and versatile professional master. He can write as well as Wang. His is the inscription in the upper left of Wang's painting, inscribed there after Wang's death. But no one would have asked him for an orthodox style landscape, although he could have painted one easily, with brushwork probably better than Wang's. Next, please. I reproduced there also one leaf from a 46-leaf album of Fun Bun, or copy sketches by Gu Jianlong, a uh, professional artist, when they had the chance to see old paintings, would make copy sketches of details from them, with notes on color and so on, for them to, uh, so they could use them in future paintings of similar subjects. Larry Sickman was smart enough, 
here as always is ahead of his time, to buy one of these albums for the Nelson Gallery. It's number 254 in the Eight Dynasties catalog. Uh, comparing leaves in it with Gu's finished paintings, we can see how he used it in painting the clothing and hair ornaments and other things uh, for court ladies, among other many other, other kinds of subjects. Gu Zhenlong reported we had a great many such albums accumulated over the years. Uh, Wang Shermin writes, as I quote him there, about seeing them in Gu's studio, piled as high as himself. Some of the leaves can be matched up with extant paintings. I reproduced one such leaf in its original in my painter's practice book as an example. The copies after landscape paintings make it clear that, as I say, Gu Chen Wung could certainly have painted high-level orthodox-style landscapes if anyone had asked him to, but nobody did. The literati painting argument about how the artist's high cultural refinement and so forth is revealed in his brushwork is, like their other arguments, a matter of self-praise, and it isn't one that we need continue to accept and teach as truth. Next. Nothing much that we have from the early literati masters, here are two familiar works described to Su Dung Po and Mi Fu, bears out this claim of deep differences in level of cultural refinement being the basis for differences between the ways the amateurs and the professionals paint. There are indeed correlations between the artist's social economic position and the way he paints, but these are based on the expectations set up for artists in Chinese society. The artists respond to these expectations in what they produce. Next. If this were a proper university course, I would, as I say, assign readings, translations from the literature of the time, concerning this distinction. The rare case of the highly educated professional master, as Chen Hong Shou was, allowed him to write a short def defense of his own situation, his essay on painting composed in 1652, that denounces artists of his time who, quote, uh, master a few phrases borrowed from old writings, as he puts it, to pass the exams and become officials, whereupon they, quote, begin to wave the brush and do paintings, but their brushwork and ink control, he continues, aren't equal to the demands they place on them, and also in, de in terms of verisimilitude, their paintings, alas, don't bear comparison with their subjects. End quote. In other words, they can't really paint things the way they look. A dangerous claim for an artist of Chun's time to make, but Chun Hong Shou was never a painter who avoided the dangerous. You'll find excerpts from his essay in my Xie Yi article, and also at the end of my Distant Mountains book. Also on the collective volume edited by Zhu Jing Li, titled Artists and Patrons, next please, in my introductory essay, I quote an interesting piece of writing, probably by the Nanjing landscapist Gu Gongxian, making this distinction between Tu and Hua, that is, pictures and paintings. Here is Gongxian's inscription as I translate it. In ancient times there were pictures, Tu, but no paintings, Hua. Pictures depict objects, portray people, or transcribe events. As for paintings, the same isn't necessarily true of them. To do a painting, one uses a good brush and antique ink and executes it on a piece of old paper. As for, the, as for the things in the painting, they are cloudy hills and misty groves, precipitous boulders and cold waterfalls, plank bridges and rustic houses. There may be figures in a painting, or no figures. To insist on a specific subject or the representation of some event is very low class. Gung Shen is referring to the fact that before the coming of literati painting in the late northern Song, but especially in the Yuan, and the rise of literati landscape, which he himself carries out, which he himself paints, uh, artists did what he calls pictures, that is, represented things, all kinds of things. Uh, and uh, he is sort of putting that down as a kind of thing that he does, he himself doesn't do anymore. And he is repeating the standard uh, argument that it's somehow low class to do pictures. Now, with that general introduction, I'll go on to show some examples of, the, of two pictures before we come to our main subjects, the pictorial hand scrolls in the album. I needed to define just what I mean by pictorial before discussing these. 
I'll show my examples quickly because I'm not meaning to discuss them individually as paintings. Most of them are in my Pictures for Use and Pleasure book, and you can read about them there. Next. To begin with, it goes without saying that the earliest pictures painted in China were just that, primarily pictures, done as true to life and as descriptively as the artists of the time could manage. Next. And yet, we could all fi already find in one of the earliest pictures preserved, the Changsha painting of a shamaness with dragon and phoenix, some indication that the artist cares about the quality and interest of the brushstrokes as such, apart from their properly descriptive function. Next. Lots of early paintings, including this hen scroll of Early Snow on the River by Zhao Gan, were full of sheer visual information gained by the artist through prolonged observation on the site. Artists who do this kind of painting are praised in writings of the time as making you feel as though you were really in the very place, end, end quote. Zhao Gan were, was famous for that, and it was pretty much ex expected of artists until the coming of the scholar amateur movement, in which the artist's precious inner life and cultural refinement was supposed to become the proper subject matter and source of expression in painting. You all know my feelings about that. Next, please. Artists of later times who painted detailed descriptive pictures that provided a lot of visual information about their subjects, such as Yuan Zhang and the Qing Dynasty, were often popular and patronized in their time, as Gu Zhen Lung was, but were badly treated by the critics, who persuaded collectors that they should be buying instead paintings such as the simple and endlessly repetitive ones of orchids and bamboo done in ink by Zheng Xie or Zheng Pan Zhao, uh, who was Yuan Zhang's fellow townsman in Yangzhou. Next. In a later lecture, I'll show at great length and in detail, a hand scroll depicting a battle by an anonymous Ming period artist who must have specialized in pictures of this kind, pictures of which, to my knowledge, only this single example survives, or else other examples are hidden away in historical archives where nobody recognizes their value as works of art. Next. In the fourth chapter of my Pictures for Use and Pleasure, I discuss briefly the category of paintings done as illustrations to texts using these two examples. I have no idea in either case who the artist was or what text is illustrated. Many illustrations of this kind, or whole albums of them, have gone through auctions and disappeared into presumably minor collections. That circumstance makes them, like other categories of pictorial art, difficult to pull together and study as a group or a type. Next. In my article on paintings for women in Mingqing, China, published in Nan Yu, number eight, and also in Chinese translation, you can find references in my bibliography on my website under 2006 to this article. In that article, I make a new argument about the much scorned Suzhou Pian hand scrolls, hand scrolls with illustrations and texts mostly ascribed to Chu Ying or to Sung period masters, and dismissed as Chu Ying fakes or Sung fakes. They used to be found in piles on tables uh, of stores in Hong Kong that sold paintings for sale cheap. I argue their that their attribution was purely a formality and meaningless, and that they were like illustrated books, to be, to be enjoyed as that by a great many people, including women, who were not big readers of learned and classical texts. This is one of many extant. They must have been produced by the hundreds as illustrated books are published, representing the story of Lady Su Hui and her palindrome. These two could become subjects of serious study once they are subjected to this re-examination or reappraisal. Next. Here are details from two of them, out of many, showing the scene in Su Hui's husband's encampment when he looks at the palindrome that she has sent, sent to him. Uh, subjects of paintings in this category are disproportionately uh, those that would have had a special appeal to women, which strengthens, I think, my belief about them. The artists who produced them would keep fun bun, or study copy sketches, from which they could endlessly produce more copies as the market demanded. Perhaps the coloring was done by assistants who had more freedom to choose colors. Next. 
high up among the surviving sets of illustrations to text are the series of 200 illustrations to the Wait Ming erotic novel, Jinping Mei, The Plum in the Golden Vase, which is appearing over the years in a great translation by David Roy. These illustrations, I believe, from their style are by Gu Zhen Lung, done during his period as a court artist in the Manchu court. The pictures in the albums are now dispersed into various collections. All this is detailed in articles I've written. Uh, from these, one could learn about the furniture and the decoration of an uh, affluent private residence, as in the one at left, or in a bordello, as the one at right. Gu Zhen Lung is careful to depict these things in detail, de depending in some part, no doubt, on his store of sketch copies from old paintings. And in addition to this, they are good storytelling pictures. Yesterday's New York Times art section had a long, enthusiastic review of an exhibition of Japanese narrative paintings in the Met, made up of, e of emaki and screens and other forms. Have we arrived at a time when we can do the same for Chinese painting? The answer apparently is not yet. Next. Another from that same series at the left represents the brocade fabric shop of the novel's anti-hero, Shi Man Ching. The artist inserts a lot of first-hand visual knowledge of how these things really looked, how the people in them or in the street outside interacted with each other. The picture at right is one leaf reproduced also in my book by a Suzhou woman artist named Fan Shui Yi, representing another kind of illustration, the picture based on what the Chinese call gu shi, or old matters, made up of instructive stories from the distant past. This one represents a Han scholar who, arriving one day late at court, explains that he had been delayed at home painting his wife's eyebrows. When the emperor responded that this was unseemly behavior for a scholar, he quipped, your servant has heard that in the intimacies between husband and wife that go on in the privacy of the boudoir, more things may occur than the painting of eyebrows. Ha ha, end quote. A comment that's a bit racy for an ancient Chinese, but Fan Shui Yi shows us only the seemly act of painting the eyebrows. Next, please. Another painting by the highly versatile and prolific Gu Zhen Lung, reproduced in my book, is this hand scroll, now in the Minneapolis Art Museum, representing Wang Shermin and his family in their residence. This introduces another type of picture, the family collective portrait. A certain hardness in the drawing suggests that such a scroll might have been produced in multiples, with copies done by Gu's assistants, perhaps, so that various family members could all have their own, and that this is one of the copies. Next, please. And here, reproduced after that one in my book, is a horizontal painting, which I take to be a fragment from a large family and residence painting done by a finer hand, perhaps Gu Zhen Lung himself, representing an open window in a house through which we see a little boy holding a book. What I write about it, you can read it there, is about how sensitively it conveys both the privilege and the predicament of such a little boy, destined by his birth into a well-off family to study for the exams from an early age. But how much this must have robbed him of the normal pleasures that little boys enjoy. What I don't tell you in the book is where I found this painting. In some museum? In an auction gallery? No. Next, please. It was hanging on the wall of the living room of the small house in Sacramento, California, of my Aunt Royal, younger sister of my mother. She traveled a lot and brought back minor paintings and prints to enjoy, and she must have bought this one in Taiwan or Hong Kong. So on one of my many visits to her, we never drove down to Berkeley from Portland or Vancouver without stopping in Sacramento to see her, sitting in her living room, drinking tea and looking up at this painting, I realized suddenly what it was. Her name was Royal, but everybody called her Cuckoo. I had called her that when I was a child, and the name stuck, so that even her husband used that as her ordinary name. So here, from the collection of my beloved Aunt Cuckoo, now deceased, is a fragment of a painting probably by, I think, Gu Zhen Lung. Next. Two more pictures of families. The one at left, a painting I found in the British Museum, 
never published or even noticed, so far as I could tell, with the family seen outside and inside their house, the women and small children in the portico and in the garden just outside, two sons perhaps sitting beneath a tree and watching three more children playing, the father and maybe a grandson or a servant in the upper right returning from a stroll. The picture at right, which I meant to include but in the end eliminated, is a large horizontal painting, perhaps originally mounted on a screen, in which the master and mistress of the household sit in separate verandas overlooking the garden, accompanied by their progeny and their servants. I photographed it when it went through art an auction. Uh, there was a signature of an artist unknown to me. Both paintings probably represent types that were common in their time, but mostly haven't been preserved. Next. Two leaves from an album of paintings of women engaged in their household activities, also reproduced in my book. The whole album is reproduced and discussed at great length in my article on paintings for women in Mingqing, China, mentioned earlier, and published in Non-New Number 8. This album I had found, or rather had been shown, at the Museum für Ostasiatischen Kunst in Cologne. Because one leaf bore a spurious signature of Chu Ying, it had gone unpublished and neglected since someone had given it to the museum. The years that I spent working on this book were years of discovery, paintings that had been known and in plain sight but not taken seriously because of wrong attributions or low-class subjects, or from being what I'm here calling the pictorial styles instead of the more prestigious brushworky ones. In Gongshen's distinction, they were Tu rather than Hua, and so had gone unrecognized. Next, please. Finding original and high-quality pictures of women had become a special objective of mine during this time, and I had delivered a series of lectures on this theme, the Getty Lectures at the University of Southern California, later in Berkeley and at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. These were never published, but I mean to put several of them on my website eventually with lots of illustrations, a project for the future. The picture at left, the frontispiece in my book, is the left section of a larger composition with a false signature of Lung Mei. The one at right is by the Chuying Academy master, Xiao Bing Zhan. Julia White and I are presently working toward an exhibition of Mei Run, or Beautiful Women Paintings, to be held at our Berkeley Art Museum in the spring of 2013. Next. One that I reproduced near the beginning of the last chapter of my recent book, in black and white because I knew it only from an old photograph, now has not only turned up in the original, but has been acquired by our museum. And I can show it in these color images. I take it to be the interior of a courtesan's reception room where she's being introduced by a girl's servant to the client. Everything in it is depicted with the greatest care and in the finest detail, including the designs on fabrics, the lattice on the window, the object in the display case. This will, of course, be in our Mayoran exhibition. Next, please. And finally, for this long introduction, two leaves from an album, now in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, purchased by them through my introduction, when my friend Tom Wu was curator, a work by the anonymous artist whom I call the Chen Lung Albums Master. He's treated in an article of mine that will soon appear in the volume Bridges to Heaven, dedicated to Wen Feng's retirement. This artist appears to have worked both inside and outside the Imperial Academy in the mid or later 18th century. The typical subjects he uses are family scenes in some very affluent perhaps princely households, providing idealized images of how these people lived, their typical activities indoors and in gardens. Next. Where the males, still wearing their official caps, enjoy the company of beautiful wives and concubines. Some of the leaves in the albums are openly erotic, and I mean to use them in my still unpublished book on Chinese erotic paintings. That concludes this long introduction and we will now turn to our main subject, the four pictorial hand scrolls in an album of my title. Next, please. 
The hand scroll I'll talk about first is a work that I knew in a small, unclear reproduction long before I saw it in the original. Uh, in the 25-volume series Zhongguo Li Dai Shu Hua Tu Mu, the big blue book that all specialists know and use that catalog and reproduce in miniature thousands of paintings in PRC collections, I saw a complete reproduction, this is a part of it, of a hand scroll in the Tianjin History Museum depicting a family and its residence. Since I had no idea how to approach the Tianjin History Museum, I asked my friend Yu Hui at the Palace Museum in Beijing about it, and he organized a trip to both, the, both that museum and the more important Tianjin Art Museum. So we saw this scroll, which was as fine as I had hoped, but I couldn't make any slides. Years later, when the two museums in Tianjin had merged into one, the Tianjin Municipal Museum, I tried contacting that to get images and permission to reproduce this and two other paintings uh, in my book. Getting no response from repeated attempts, I at last turned to my colleague and good friend, Frida Merck, who has helped me and many others make contacts in China. She combines scholarly expertise with a great social and diplomatic skill so that she can accomplish things that hardly anybody else could. This is a photo of her that she sent me at my request. She's standing, as you see, in front of the great Gua Xi early spring painting. And indeed, she made phone calls to the new Tianjin Museum director and curator and explained my needs. They were able to find and photograph the hand scroll, expressing great bewilderment over why this mysterious foreigner would want images of such an undistinguished piece, which they had been totally unaware of owning. And at last I received four good images covering the entire scroll. Next please, the first of them. I have no details as such, but the four section images are so high resolution that we can draw details out of them and show the entire scroll, which of course I couldn't do in my book. The scroll is anonymous, a seal at the end reading Zhang something may be the artist, but he isn't identifiable. I would assume that the painting dates from the mid-18th century or so, and that it was done by some artist who specialized in paintings of this kind, commissioned by the family, just as Gu Jianlun was commissioned by Wang Shermin to paint his family in their residence. The painting opens at far right, uh, showing the entryway, the wall with an open door through which we enter in imagination. This is a standard way for such scrolls to open, including hand scroll paintings of gardens. Inside, we see the garden, and sitting on a large outdoor kong or platform, the master of the household. He's observing and supervising the watering of potted plants. Three servants nearer to the gate bring him tea and other things on trays while two more servants haul up a heavy pot of growing plants from the pond. He has a Tao, Japanese chitsu, of books on the platform beside him, one volume missing, which he holds in his hand. He's reading it. Ornamental rocks are arranged here and there, small ones near him, larger ones in the distance. The trees are green with leafage. The lotuses on the pond are blossoming. Nothing disturbs his sense of contentment. He is lord of all he sees. Next, please. Going on. And rolling on, we see the whole of the garden pond. On its far side, in a space enclosed by a railing, are two cranes, auspicious symbols of longevity. Projecting toward us from the corner of this enclosure is, an, is a small island with willows growing on it. And just beyond it, on the far side, we see a boat with four figures of boys or young men in it, one mostly hidden behind the trunk of the willow. One of them, wearing a blue coat, leans over to cut a lotus blossom in the water to put into a pot in the boat. They are gathering lotus. A younger boy in white kneels on the prow of the boat with an oar over his knees. These, we can guess, are the younger sons of the family. The pointed roof of a building appears at the bottom, the main part below the margin of the scroll. Above, the roof of a gallery appears and develops below into an open porch in which a man sits holding a fishing pole, fishing in the pond. 
He's an older man, probably the oldest son, who is given this place of prominence. We see two Tao of books behind him, along with a brush holder and brushes, indications that he's a scholar, perhaps a degree candidate. Closer to us are two women, perhaps his wife and concubine, or his wife and a servant. One of them carries a tray on which she is bringing him something. Mounted in the lower panels of the building, outside and inside, we see the figured marble panels called Dali Shur, indications of wealth and, and elegance. Next. The roof of this gallery disappears below, beneath another willow. Above, in a distant part of the garden, two peacocks are seen beyond another large garden rock. And then, again proceeding diagonally downward, the outer wall of a larger building announces that we have arrived at the main residence building. Its lower part is faced with flat stones. It ends at a corner and continues leftward horizontally with large latticed windows opening in it. In front, banana palms with large green leaves, another garden rock, this one penetrated with holes like a true taihusher, and another pair of large birds, white, which I can't identify, some kind of pheasants perhaps. The domesticated birds are always shown in pairs, indicating harmony. The front of the building, behind, angles outward toward us. Another large window is seen, and another servant carrying something to drink, approaching the climactic scene of the scroll. Next, please. Where the, the woman of the house, the main focus of this latter part of the scroll, is shown sitting in the main entryway. She dominates all around her as much as her husband dominated the garden at the beginning, not so much by size as by placement and by facing outward. She wears a dark green robe, and she appears to have some kind of ornaments in her hair. She's observing a servant outside who is watering Narcissus, growing in a large porcelain tub on a stand. In another tub next to it is a dwarf tree, Pansai, Japanese bonsai. Uh, grow, growing in the tub, as with so many other words like zen or tofu or ramen, the Japanese word was introduced to English first, and so it's more familiar than the original Chinese. So I say bonsai rather than panzai. Uh, two little dogs, perhaps your personal pets, appear below, one with black markings, the other with brown. Another woman servant stands turned toward her, waiting to fulfill her wishes. She holds a flower in one hand, and in the other a large fan on which is a design. The design is perfectly clear, but I can't identify it. On a long table along the other side of the entryway are smaller potted plants and rocks. Beside them is a flowering tree, and then another wall with a large moon-shaped opening, indicating the end of this pri privileged realm. Another younger servant, robed in light green, is seen coming through it, carrying a brocade-wrapped object, perhaps a chin or a zither for her to play. Passing an imagination through this opening, we observe the continuation of the main building disappearing above with a doorway through which the railing of another courtyard can be seen. The walkway continues leftward and disappears. The scroll is ended. We entered through one gate, we're given our privileged view of the residence and its participants, and now we exit through another gate. I need not point out, I hope, how much we have learned visually about how an elegant upper-class residence was laid out in the Middle Qing period. Architectural historians and social historians can learn a lot from this neglected work, which would still be lying unnoticed among hundreds of others in the museum's storage room if I had not noticed it and brought it out, who knows how many more of comparable quality and interest still lie neglected. The future task of all you Chinese art historians is obvious. Next, please. Our second pictorial hand scroll is far less refined in its drawing, but also brings us, in its way, a, a lot of pictorial information about another world, that of travel on the canals of China. I know it only from an old auction catalog, Christie's Hong Kong for May 2005. I requested and received from the auction house detailed photos of the scroll, and I use these 
with thanks to Christie's, in showing it. The scroll recently re reappeared in another auction catalog. I have no idea where it is now. Here first is a detail from the end of the scroll with the artist's signature and date. The artist is a little-known figure master from Wuxi named Yao Tsai. The date is 1774. From colophones attached to it, we know that it depicts at length the scenery along the route taken by the official Bi Wan, who lived from 1730 to 1795, in returning home upon his retirement. It was presumably painted for a presentation to him on that occasion. We'll see another hand scroll later, the last in our group, made to be presented to a retiring official. This must have been a common custom. And when enough of them have been assembled and studied, someone can write a learned article about them. Meanwhile, I'll just show the scroll rather more quickly because I really have little to say about it. I want mostly to call it to the attention of others who may be able to read it with more educated eyes than mine. Next, please. Here is the beginning of the scroll. Let me say immediately that, as always, a careful reading of the inscriptions attached to it would provide information that would allow a much more thorough description of what it's, what's happening in it. My account will be uh, superficial and, and based only on looking at the painting, and it serves the main purpose of accompanying a visual presentation of it. Uh, since the main boats, as we'll see later, are all moving leftward, that is, toward the wall of the city, that's presumably Sujo, the natural assumption must be that Sujo is his home, to which he is now returning, and that the place where he served as an official and is now leaving will be identifiable along the way, so we'll watch for it. The opening of the scroll is very quiet and undramatic, all the figures and boats relatively small. The canal enters from the upper left and broad, upper right, I mean, and broadens as it passes beneath several bridges. Uh, I could comment on the buildings and figure groups on shore, but I won't. Next. Further along, notice the western style converging line perspective drawing of the large building in upper left, and the use of shading and other foreign derived devices throughout the scroll. By this time, 1775, all these illusionistic tricks had spread from the Manchu Court Academy, where they were practiced enthusiastically, for artists outside to use them freely if they chose to. I have a long article that's just appearing in the retirement volume for Wenfong, Bridges to Heaven, in which I discuss this and related matters. As we roll leftward, more red-hatted men appear, all turning toward the left, and we can anticipate encountering something important further on. Next. <clears throat> Rolling on, we continue to see groups of red-headed men all looking leftward, leading us toward the climax. But also we see in the detail a smaller boat with a man and woman and their son or servant sculling it. The boat is loaded with things presumably for sale, fruit and melons, Buddha's hand fruits, flowers and vases, pots of wine. Such genre details must have been intended to remind the recipient, be one, of things he had seen on his many trips by canal between his home and his official posts. Artists who painted such scrolls had, we must assume, pictorial repertories ready to use for painting many scrolls of this kind. They didn't work by one-time observation and depiction. Next, please. Now we arrive at the pivotal scene for which the foregoing has prepared us. Two larger figures, obviously high officials, seated on the edge of the canal. Another uh, uh, smaller figures all turn toward them. This one with the mustache uh, looks very much like the central figure we'll see later in a boat, who is B1. And it may be that he is represented twice in the scroll, once at the departure place, waiting for his boat, and again in the boat. In the upper left, another man, flanked with two boys, comes out from the entryway of a house, which has a watchtower outside it. Next. As we roll on, more genre figures appear on the further shore, which is now giving way as our focus of attention, as boats appear in the foreground, with many more red-hatted men in them. In the upper left, we see the stern of a large boat, and rolling further, we find we have indeed reached the central image of the scroll, 
a large boat with many figures in it, officials and others, and central among them, looking out at us from the large boat window, is B. Wan himself. No question of his identity this time. Beside him is his little boy. Women and children are seen through a window in the prow. Another large boat with another important figure in it, probably the same who sat beside B. Wan on the shore, appears below and to the left. They are presumably proceeding together back to Suzhou. The large figure in it may be another official or perhaps his principal son. All these matters could probably be cleared up by a careful reading of the, of the accompanying inscriptions. Next, please. Further on and closer to the near shore is another boat in which we see two more important figures who are not officials but probably are family members who lived with Biwan during his official service and now accompany him back to Suzhou. Further along on the nearer shore, as we approach the wall of Suzhou, women and children are waiting, and some kind of cargo boat is just offshore. It may be here that they are all to disembark, or maybe they will proceed through the water gate in the city wall. Next. And here is the end of the scroll, where the Suzhou city wall dramatically closes off the space, with only the passage below the water gate through which boats can pass to enter or exit the city. The artist's inscription that we saw in a detail earlier is in the far lower left. The storied building in upper left was probably another familiar site, but I can't tell you what it is. The journey by canal is ended. The B family are back in their home, and we leave this painting. Next. Now we will look briefly at the album. This too has as its principal figure an official of some rank. In this case, he appears to be a lower ranking official serving in his home district, but also traveling on various pursuits. The 14 leaves of the album all show him as the main figure, usually larger than the others, and always seen full face. One leaf of this album is uh, reproduced as figure 416, 4.16 in my vernacular painting book. No writing accompanies the album, and there are no seals on it to identify either the artist or the subject. We can only see it then as an example of a type, of which several other examples are cited in my accompanying text, one of them by Lung Mei. I take this album to be around the same time as Lung Mei's period of activity, in date that is, in the um, early to mid 18th century. It's owned by a dealer in New York. In this first leaf, and my numbering is purely arbitrary, no numbers are on the paintings. In this first leaf, he sits with his wife and children on a Kong uh, platform just inside his house, looking out at a pond where a pair of cranes has come to convey an auspicious message. One of his sons holds a long pole and seems to be indicating something in the water, which a younger son on the steps leans down to scoop up. Two older sons stand behind, and a maid brings tea next. I'll show them quickly because I haven't much to say about them. Here he sits in his rather disorderly garden, watching two small service servant boys uh, working. Another beside him, probably one of his sons, holds a vase with a flower. Next. This is the leaf that I reproduced in my book. I take it to represent uh, this man serving in one of his roles, listening to the petitions and complaints of the peasants who occupy his estate. I describe it there, so I won't do it here. Next. Here he's seen in an open corner room of the house, playing some card game with his sons, while dandling a younger one on his knee. The images and albums and hand scrolls of this kind hover between showing particulars of the man's life and surroundings, that is, of the person they were done for, and presenting him as a series of conventional exemplary roles. The, the Yongzheng Emperor in the mid-18th century had such albums done by his court artists, with himself, of course, as the central figure. Next. In this leaf, he leads on horseback a group of mounted travelers along a mountain road, with a servant on foot following behind. Those who accompany him are portrayed as markedly different in age, from quite young boys to old men with twisted faces. I have no idea what is happening here. Next. Here he stands alone in a landscape with the mountains painted in the blue and green manner, itself auspicious and popular, while a procession of mounted men wearing official caps 
winds its way through the valley toward him. Banners in the distance enhance the importance of the occasion, in which he must have received some kind of official visit. Next. Here he sits in the stern of a sailboat on a rushing river that flows out of a ravine with the rocks again painted in the blue and green manner. Next. And here he sits alone, attended only by a servant, on a seashore or perhaps a lake or a river shore, looking out over the turbulent waves. Whoever the artist was, he had mastered a standard repertory for professional painters of the proper way to depict waves, rocks, trees, and all the rest. Next. Now he sits outside his house, examining swords. He has drawn one from its scabbard. A servant behind him holds another, and a boy brings another from the right. One can imagine the man, or someone else who commissioned the album for him, giving the artist a general set of instructions about how he should be depicted, what he should be doing. Again, partly based on his real preferences, he may have been a collector of swords or fancied himself a connoisseur of them, and partly on established conventions. Next. Here he rides in a cart through the landscape, accompanied by servants, and with another behind them wheeling some heavy load in a kind of barrow. Examples of how such paintings were commissioned from the artist and paid for are given in my book, The Painter's Practice. Next. Here he sits out outside beneath a willow tree, a servant beside him offering tea on a tray, while his grooms bring some of his horses to show him, one saddled for him to ride if he wants to. The artist is only moderately capable of painting horses. We will observe similar disparities in how parts of the picture are painted in other works, such as the hand scroll we'll look at next. Next. Here he is doing target practice with a bow and arrow. The target is hung from a rope strung across two supports. One servant holds his hat and cape. Others hold another bow and arrow and a quiver of arrows. One obvious kind of value these pictures have that compensates in part for their more moderate artistic achievements is, to make the point once more, the way they supply visual information about a diversity of scenes and practices. People write to me with questions like, do you know any old depictions of Chinese archery? And when my memory serves, I send them to or send them pictures of this kind. Next. In this leaf, he sits leaning on the railing of the open veranda of his house accompanied by two guests, looking out over a pond where two white egrets have alighted. Servants on the bank prepare food and drink to bring to them. Next. And here in the last leaf, in my arbitrary numbering, he's seen serving as a kind of local magistrate, judging the complaints or requests of petitioners. Two of them kneel before him. He and his servants wear the red hats that indicate their rank. A tall man wearing a blue robe holds a long horn with which he has announced that, uh, that court is in session. And with that, we end our brief consideration of this album, and we go on to show and talk about the other two pictorial hand scrolls. Next. The first of these two has the best possible reason for instant dismissal by any traditional Chinese connoisseur. It bears a false signature and seals seen here in a detail from the end of the scroll, purporting to be those of the early Yuan master, Chen Shren. The painting is obviously much later and not even in his style, so it has remained in obscurity until a dealer sent images of it to Lulu Brotherton, properly Elizabeth Brotherton, whom I've mentioned in earlier lectures as the daughter of my good friend, Joe Brotherton, and a fine young scholar who took a Princeton PhD and teaches now in New Paltz, New York. Lulu sent the images to me for confirmation of her own opinion, and I contacted the dealer about possibly acquiring the scroll for our Berkeley Art Museum, for reasons that you'll see. But the owner doesn't want to sell it, and remains anonymous, so I know it only from these images, and I have no details. But fortunately, again, the images are good enough that you can see a lot just from these sections. Next. I believe, based on its style, that the painting is a work of the mid to later 18th century, probably Chen Lung era, and it was done in the Beijing region by one of the figure specialists who worked outside the Imperial Academy, Imperial Academy, but who were affected by developments within it. The painter of this was obviously 
one of those heavily affected by European stylistic intrusions, and he worked in a Sino-European manner. What he offers is a detailed look at life in some village, a close visual account that must be based on lots of prolonged first-hand observation and making numerous sketches. He probably painted other versions of it, perhaps many of them. And what I want to emphasize once more is that we can learn a great deal about the material culture aspects of village life at this still to be identified time and place from his picture. Next, the scroll opens with a view of the canal at the edge of the, of the village with three fishing boats drawn up on the shore and an old man holding a scale who has come to dicker with a fisherman. On the opposite shore are buildings, probably restaurants, with rooms opening on the water. Various other things are going on. I'm certainly not going to try to describe everything to be seen in this richly populated picture. Next. Here we are shown a village school in the upper right with an old literatus as master and his boy pupils. Also scenes of farming, plowing and hoeing the fields. A large family in lower right deals with a peddler and others. Next. In the upper part of this section, sitting at his desk, an official serves as judge, presiding over an outdoor court attended by supplicants both high and low in economic level, more are arriving in the lower right. Next. Rolling on, we cross another broader canal on which a large boat propelled by rowers is seen. Uh, people have gathered on the shore to watch it go by. Smaller boats are crossing the canal below. As elsewhere in the scroll, there's lots of interaction going on between the figures. They talk to each other, turn toward each other, gesture at each other. Next. Here we see carpenters building a house in an area screened off to keep away intruders. At the top, one of them is already laying roof tiles. This is a detailed picture showing tools and their use. I count ten different kinds of tools and it would surely interest specialists in Chinese material culture and vernacular architecture. Next, please. A more prosperous family household with views into its upstairs and further rooms and its members dealing with peddlers and others. A procession of high-ranking gentlemen comes down from upper left, led by a drummer. Above them, a hand puppet show is watched by a crowd. Next. A traveling vendor with a performing dog and monkey, performs in a courtyard. In the center, a Buddhist or maybe Taoist establishment with monks and nuns. In the upper left, another puppet show, this one with string puppets. We're moving into the downtown area of the village. Next, please. And here we are right in it. A street angles upward with shops and booths and quick snack places opening onto it. Three more below. This is the village market. In the foreground, we see farmers haggling over sales of livestock. In upper, in upper left, a performance of the local opera, perhaps, its audience with upturned faces. And next, finally, at the end of the scroll, a woman walking a tightrope above and below another performing on a swing. And the fake Chen Shuan signature in lower left, which, as I said, for any cultivated Chinese collector would invalidate all that went before and renders it unworthy of our attention. Next. I should say that in looking at these pictorial paintings, we are not exactly gazing into the past. We are gazing into a hidden area of Chinese painting, exposed in the sense that anybody who wanted to could have bought one of these paintings, comparatively cheap, and enjoyed looking at it, but hidden in the sense that they were forbidden to look at it seriously, to take it as estimable painting to recognize it as having much merit as anything but entertainment. Once, after I had given a lecture on paintings of this kind to an audience of faculty and students in the new so-called art history program at Beida, that is Beijing, Beijing University, I say so-called because it's so determinedly based in text reading, not object looking. After my lecture, one of the students spoke up, probably representing the majority, and he asked me, Professor Cahill, you have shown us pictures of street peddlers, toy sellers, and people like that. But what does this have to do with art? I wanted to reply, I can show you a whole series of the late works of Wang Hui and other orthodox school landscapists, and then ask, 
what have these to do with art? But my wife, Shingan, who was interpreting for me, had already answered him, probably excusing my strange Occidental ideas. She was never completely in tune with this aberrant direction of mine. The year before last, when I was still traveling more easily, I took part in a symposium in Taipei on Chinese material culture, and I ended my paper with these paragraphs. I hope that the examples I've shown have convinced you not merely of the value of vernacular painting as a source of visual information for material culture studies, but of its value as well in studies of Chinese social and cultural history more broadly, including women's studies, and that it enables us to go beyond the taste associated with the male elite minority to reach some understanding of the tastes exercised by the vastly broader Chinese audience for paintings, including women and those on lower economic levels. Expanding our study, studies to include it, along with some other critically neglected kinds of Chinese painting, will bring benefits similar to those achieved over the past century or so by the expansion of Chinese literary studies to include vernacular literature, opening up new worlds to our understanding. The expansion will also be in the thematics of painting, where literati painting is largely limited to presenting conventional views of an ideal world toward which the proper literatus was supposed to be striving, vernacular painting was more likely to represent in detail less idealized images of the real quotidian worlds in which the audiences for the pictures moved about. But that desirable outcome continues to be blocked by the perpetuation of the pro-literati painting orthodoxy's dominance a perpetuation that is itself a curious phenomenon, badly in need of some objective reappraisal. The equivalent in Western art history no longer rules. Instead, as one writer puts it, quote, in the 20th century, the successful assimilation of artistic taste as an integral component in the construction of normative bourgeois identity was to achieve its most thoroughgoing and analytical recognition, and in a sense, its nemesis, in Pierre Bourdieu, Bourdieu's distinction, end quote. I'm certainly not equating Chinese literary culture with European bourgeois culture, but the classically educated male elite that made up the literati class in China, identified by the self-chosen criterion of proficiency in canonical texts written in archaic languages, and by, in Bourdieu's words, treating as a birthright the virtuosity acquired through long familiarization or through the exercises of methodical training, end quote, certainly qualify within his system as richly deserving of deconstruction. So, I continue, my final question is this. We've all read our Bourdieu. We know that aesthetic judgments presented as absolute turn out to be strongly conditioned or even determined by considerations of social and economic class. Why then do we continue to think and write and teach so much of the time as though we didn't know this? As though, that is, the superiority of brushwork-oriented painting in the literati styles over the more pictorial kinds of painting I've shown were a central truth about Chinese painting beyond questioning to be taught to our students and thus perpetuated as a piece of eternal wisdom I hope that the publication of my book will go some way toward changing that situation and that I will still be around to watch it change. Thank you. That ends this passage from my material culture talk. Now back to our pictorial hand scrolls. Next, please. The other one, and the last painting we'll see in this lecture, is devoted to a tour of the busy shops and entertainment district once located at the base of the Tiger Hill outside Suzhou. It's a long scroll painted in ink and colors on silk from which I have only a series of sections and details, no full coverage that is. When I saw it, it was owned by Andrew Franklin, next please, a career diplomat who had been the British consul in Taipei during the 1950s and was now living in retirement on the outskirts of London. I visited him to see and photograph some leaves he owned from the series of Jinping Mei illustrations that I spoke about earlier which I believe to be the work of Gu Jian Lung. How a group of the Jinping Mei illustrations came on the market cheap in Taipei so that he could buy them is a long story that I tell elsewhere. 
When we were finished with these, he brought out more pieces from his painting collection to show me, and this hand scroll was among them. It's now in the Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery. After Franklin's death, his heirs gave much of his collection to, to them in lieu of taxes, as the catalog puts it. The remainder was auctioned off in South Kensington, and this photo of him and his wife is from that, from this auction catalog. I've tried to get a set of photos of the entire scroll from the Birmingham Museum, but they have either answered that it hasn't been photographed yet, and they are very busy, or they haven't responded at all. So details only for now. But someone should persist, maybe even go to Birmingham and pound on a desk. Next, please. The scroll opens with a procession of mounted men wearing the kind of red top caps that, as we saw in the canal scroll, may indicate some official status. Accompanied by their servants, they ride along while turning their faces toward us. They are clearly portrait faces, representing real people who took part in the real event. As we learn from an accompanying inscription, and alas, I've lost my slide of that, it's a farewell party given for a certain Su Dingyuan. The inscription reads in part, <coughs> Mr. Su Dingyuan has administered Jiangsu for five years. Mr. Lao invited him on a spring outing to the eastern suburbs and commissioned a painter, Hua Shi, to make this picture. Starting at Duya, it portrays the neighborhood of Tiger Hill with its environs. All the assembled people had a good time, as if they were climbing the spring terrace. When I saw the painting, I gave it the title, Spring Pleasures at Tiger Hill and added the poem, and then the poem follows. And he ends with, Modes of the Year of the Chenlong Era, that is 1768, inscribed by Zhao Shouchen. Um, the term that's used for the artist, washer, means something like artisan painter, and it indicates the low esteem in which he was held. They didn't even trouble to record his name. The artists, like the artists of the other scrolls in the album we've seen, he must have specialized in pictures of this kind, depicting familiar materials in most of his scroll, filling in a few narrative bits for this special assignment. It's obvious that he's not a good painter of horses. He may have employed a local portrait specialist to sketch the participants during the party and then paint in their faces in the opening passage. That, too, is a low calling. It must have been like having your photos taken in a carnival booth. Now we're going on. Next. I meant to reproduce in my book for comparison, but somehow didn't, this opening section of a scroll in the Metropolitan Museum, one of the imperial series showing the Chenlong Emperor's visit to Sujo. The Met's curator, Mike Hearn, has written a good article about these. Again, the emperor is made the central figure by portraying him larger and the only one facing directly outward, a convention that's now familiar to us. The portrayal of all the other figures and of their setting is stiff and conventional. Nothing can distract attention from the imperial figure. Next. The rest of the scroll is the same. Conventional figures, only conventional portrayal of the shops on the Sutro streets. As I remark in the book, the artist of such a scroll wouldn't presume to introduce entertaining genre details into a work intended for the imperial gaze. Next, please. This is a section of a similar scroll in the Liaoning Museum, also recording an imperial visit to Suzhou, by the same artist or group of artists as the Met scroll. In the upper right is exactly the entertainment district that our low-class scroll is devoted to. But again, it's too staid to offend the imperial gaze with trivialities. Scrolls such as these two are treasures, much sought after and very expensive when they come on the market. Franklin, on the other hand, must have bought his scroll for maybe the price of a good banquet in Taipei. Next. Here are two passages from the Franklin scroll, very different indeed from the imperial ones, full of narrative and incident and observation. A passage near the beginning at right, one that's near the end at left. In the latter, near the end, we see the place toward which the procession is headed, where the principals will enter one of the canal boats, seen below, and enjoy the drinking and entertainment that's prepared for them. On the street above them is a kind of welcoming party waiting, an old woman and man 
who may be relatives, the old woman holding by the hand a child who turns to look up at a younger woman, perhaps its mother, who is holding a baby, further back a group of men with red hats, one of them ogling the women through a lens. Lenses of this kind were common in China by this time, and they are often seen in paintings. The other section, near the beginning of the scroll on the right, shows some outrunners of Su Dingyuan's procession who have gone ahead of them to clear the way. They carry signs proclaiming their importance, and they turn toward each other, not paying much attention to the attractions they are passing. They may know those already. Next. But our attention is drawn to what is behind them, an antique shop depicted in fine detail. This is the kind of local color that our anonymous artist has mastered through portraying it many times, an accomplishment for which he gets no credit in the elite Chinese system of values. And it gives us a unique view of what kinds of objects these shops featured in this time and place. Historians have used woodblock illustrations in books for information of this kind. But these woodblock pictures are colorless, linear, and more schematic. We see ancient vessels of familiar types here, a blue and white porcelain Meiping, a jade Rui scepter and a bamboo brush holder, a jade sounding stone hanging in an intricate wood frame, peacock tail feathers and a bronze yo vessel. These are easy to recognize. Proper object people can identify more. Next. Below, in one of the many boats, a group of musicians are playing instruments. From right to left, they are some kind of sounding stones struck and struck like chimes, a yuan, which is a shamisen-like plucked instrument, a sheng, or mouth organ, wooden clappers and a drum, a flute. A woman above prepares little plates of things to eat. Next. Among the famous artifacts produced at the Tiger Hill were mechanical dolls and automata. In my book I write, in chapter 67 of, of every traditional Chinese reader's favorite novel, Hung Lo Meng, The Dream of the Red Chamber, we can read a description of a group of these toys brought back for Bao Jai by her brother from a trip to Suzhou. She gives a few of them to Lin Dai Yu, to whom they bring on a severe attack of nostalgia for her home city. The novelties from Hu Cho Shan, Tiger Hill, that are described include, quote, little mercury-filled automata who turn somersaults when you put them down on the floor or a table, automata with sand-filled cylindrical bodies whose arms and heads moved when you set the sand running, and lots and lots of scenes from drama made up of tiny figures molded in colored clay, end quote. Where else than in this scroll, and one may hope in others of a kind still undiscovered, is this description in words matched with images. In a shop selling dolls, probably automata of this kind, notice the clock behind, the bespectacled, bespectacled artisan touches up the head of one of them. Next. A few more details quickly from this extraordinary pictorial document. A group of gentry women have taken their children with them for an outing in one of the boats. One is having her hair done, another holds a folding fan. We can be sure that our artist, Mr. X, I have to call him that because nobody thought well enough of him to record his name, uh, Mr. X kept abreast of the fashions in women's garments and their patterns. Next. A boat woman has positioned her boat beneath the bridge and looks upward, hoping that one of the men passing over will see her and engage her, or the other woman in the boat, who looks through the curtain at the other end. She is probably a prostitute waiting for a customer. In my book, I mistook her, for, mistook her for a little boy. Next. Two more details. In one of them, two of the front runners of the procession, carrying signs which I assume mean something like, get out of the way, go through a doorway. Behind them, a woman and a man are serving tea or something else to drink, which he pours from a large pot into cups. In the other detail, Another curio dealer stands behind the counter on which some of his offerings are displayed, a conch shell at one end, an Yixing teapot at the other, small objects that I can't identify between them. Behind him are paintings he has for sale, hung from a line, which you can buy cheap and take home and have mounted for display if you want. The one on the upper right depicts a woman reclining on a large banana leaf. A painting in the Metropolitan Museum attributed to Tang Yin, the Ming artist, resembles this. 
I made a little joke about that in my text. A row of Buddhist monks stands in the foreground. I can't recall what kind of scene they belong to. This may be the entrance to a temple, as the column in the courtyard behind suggests. Next, please. Here, a man and his son stand at the outdoor table spread with little dishes of good things to eat from which they can choose and make their dinner. How well I remember making a very enjoyable dinner with a friend, Hugh Was, from a place like this in Taipei, a place we return to often. Uh, closer in in this detail, another man fishes in the canal. Next, please. A waterside restaurant, its rooms open to our gaze. Through the moon window at right, we see a woman near the entrance, working at an abacus. Red-hatted men are entering, others drinking in an upstairs room. Servants in the center, one carrying a tray, the other gesturing, telling him where to take it. Another leans over the railing to buy two fish from a man in a boat. In the upper left, a woman is seen through a window, hanging out garments to dry on a line with potted plants in front of her on the tiled roof to get watered. Uh, two women in the room below eat their dinner as a little boy gestures to them from his confining box. Next, please. Below this, in a boat on the canal, a man drinks from a cup while another looks out. The boat woman looks to the shore. But I really can't describe all that's going on in these pictures. It's enough to say that the scroll is full of incident and interaction and suggestions of human feeling, uncommon in the kinds of Chinese paintings that are more familiar to us. I make this point in the long ending paragraph of my fourth chapter, which follows the passages on this scroll, writing, well, but before reading that, let me change to another detail. Next. This one, which I find especially evocative and moving. A woman stands at the open front of her modest rooms, her little boy pulling at her and pointing, her maid in the next room, which is a kitchen, that's the stove partly seen behind her. The maid draws water from the canal in a bucket. The woman I take to be an entertainer, a courtesan or a prostitute. She gazes out over the canal moodily. Behind her, pinned simply to the wall, are three bird and flower paintings, suggesting, as I write in my book, a modest way of life that is not without its simple refinements. I will leave this on for you to gaze at while I read the last paragraph of this chapter in my book, which says things that are important, I think, to this whole lecture. So here we go with that. A point to be made strongly in dealing with low-class paintings of this kind is that it is not merely a matter of the excluded categories of Chinese painting being, on the whole, equal in quality to the more familiar kinds. They often exhibit quality, qualities that cannot easily be found among the critically accepted categories. This is because the artists who did them were permitted by their very exclusion from the polite realm of painting to infuse their works with expressions of human feeling and warmth, incident and drama, close observation of the world around them, and more relaxed renderings of scenes of everyday life that were taboo for their more critically elevated contemporaries. High quality in Chinese painting, at least since the Song Dynasty, had been implicitly defined as the absence of just those qualities, since true connoisseurs should not succumb to such blandishments, and we have unthinkingly accepted this version of the matter. Let me change images now before continuing. Here, next please. A shop that sells the kind of roly-poly dolls, like Japanese daruma dolls, that pop up again when you push them over. The little boy tugs at his father's robe and points to one he wants on a shelf as the woman reaches around to get it down. A red-capped man at the far end of the counter, holding a fan, watches them through spectacles. An older woman, seen through a window at right with two children, is busy making more of them. Now I'll continue with reading my paragraph to finish it. Another generation of searching out Reattributing, reordering, and reassessing these paintings will be needed before we can make with confidence the kind of statement I am about to make as a conjecture. What we have assumed to be deficiencies in post-Song Chinese painting, the absence of areas of subject matter and expression that are taken for granted in the European and the American traditions of painting, or in the Japanese ukiyo-e and fuzokuga schools of genre painting, 
may prove to be absences only within the confines of the official version of the art. Much of what we have felt to be missing, from Chinese painting that is, may well prove after all to be there once we look outside the conventional boundaries beyond the walls that the Chinese literati critics have erected. Now back to finish looking at this painting, um, or to finish this uh, long lecture. So that ends our long look at four pictorial hand scrolls in an album. I'm sure that most of you who found them entertaining and unexpectedly interesting. That, of course, is my purpose. Others of you, next please. Others of you who are die-hard devotees of literati or scholar amateur painting will feel that you would rather have spent the time contemplating in a leisurely way some painting that you find aesthetically superior, such as the landscape hand scroll by Li Ruhua that we began with, savoring the subtleties of this sensitive literatus's touch of brush to paper, instead of being made to look at these trivial and low-class paintings. On the page of my book where I reproduced this painting by Li Ruhua, I quote a line about it from the catalog I copied it from, reading, quote, The landscape serves as a vehicle for the poet painter to express his desire to rise above the vicissitudes of the mundane world, end quote. Wow. That was written by my colleague Zhu Jing Li. Since you have just spent an hour or so gazing at loving portrayals of the vicissitudes of the mundane world, pictures that Li Ruhua would never have spent time with, since his desire was to rise above it, the choice is open before you. Those who prefer the Li Ruhua painting belong, as I said in an earlier lecture, in that other classroom down the hall. Those of you who have enjoyed looking at my pictorial hand scrolls and album, stick with me. More good things are to come. Actually, the next lecture will be about a great literatus artist and a wonderful album of landscapes by him. So we will get the best of both worlds. At least that's my intention. And that, at last, is the end of this long lecture. Thank you.